Hi, this is Josh Marshall, and this is the Josh Marshall Podcast. Uh, third episode of the year. Um, got a new uh, range of topics to talk about. You know, we're 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 going to get into this Biden classified documents thing, which I I think is a crock, and 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 I am militant about it being a crock, and and you know, I get all these. Either hear from people I know in the sort of the political and news business, or I hear from readers, and it's kind of like you know, uh, sure it's a crock, but the reality is that this is it just seems the same, and so uh, you know, kiss goodbye any any chance of Trump being indicted over the Mar-a-Lago stuff. And where, 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 and sad trombone, and womp, 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 and all that kind of stuff. And I just can't deal. I cannot deal. I, I, I have to tell you, I officially cannot deal. If you're wanting me to deal on the podcast today, I'm telling you, I cannot deal. I cannot take that. Because here's the thing. You know, first of all, I'm not living and dying on whether Trump gets indicted because of the stuff in Mar-a-Lago. That's a legal case. It's being investigated. I think there's a pretty good chance he will be indicted because the behavior is so egregious, is uh, involves obstruction, involves you know claiming the stuff is his, blah 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 blah. Um, but you know, I was talk, talking to one reader uh, about this, and he's saying, you know, it it's Biden has ruined everything because the Mar-a-Lago thing is over right now. Well, first of all, I don't buy that because the two situations really have nothing to do with each other. They have no comparison to each other. And at the end of the day, call me naive, but I think prosecutors mostly go along with what the facts and the law say. Does politics figure into it at some level? Of course it does, and properly. We don't live in a vacuum. You need things to seem legitimate, blah, 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 blah. Um, but like, if, if, if Trump isn't indicted because of this non-issue with Biden, like, okay. I'm not going to lose a lot of sleep over that, frankly. Um, but I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, and I think um, most people, despite what you see in Washington, D.C., I think most people can tell the difference. The hardcore Trumpers say this stuff about, oh, it shows that, uh, you know, he was, be everybody does it and he was being unfair. You know what? You can't live in, you can't live in other people's bullshit. You just have to sort of keep right on what is actually happening, what the facts are, what's real and what's not, and just proceed along on that basis. So I, uh, as I said before, if you're wanting me to deal here, I cannot deal. I can't do that. I can't, I can't go along with this nonsense. But we're going to, uh, Kate and I are going to get into that nonsense a bit because that's what we're all talking about. Um, and then we've got the ongoing uh, Santos thing. And, you know, it's funny. Like I, yesterday, um, mid-evening, I heard this story. Maybe you've heard it already. In some ways, it is a pretty minor offense when you when you figure the full range of things that George Santos has done and yet somehow it it kind of seemed like the worst to me it just got me at a level of of sheer cruelty and malevolence and casual indifference to the existence of other people that it really kind of got me and um I noticed, so I, so I figured, like, I got, I got to write this up. And I looked at the site, and I noticed that, like, everywhere above the fold, every story was on George Santos, right? And I'm sure whenever that happens, uh, some readers say, dude, you know, there's other stuff going on besides George Santos. And that's absolutely true. And, uh, you know, when the page ends up like that, I get when people feel that way. But the Santos story is kind of, for me at least, it, it, it goes beyond just your average uh, politician crook 
story. Um, and those stories are always better when they're not only politician crook, but politician crook clown, which he definitely is. He, let, let me just tell you this story. Okay. So one of the things that has been known about Santos pretty much from the beginning, I think it was first revealed in that time story, which kind of got the whole ball rolling, what, three weeks ago now, something like that, uh, that he, you know, one of his, part of his CV, his political CV, is that he, um, wait, friends or pets? Yeah, friends or pets united. That he had this animal, dog, you know, animal charity, helping dogs. I think it was just dogs. Maybe it was all pets, parakeets, whatever. Anyway, probably focusing on dogs, called Friends of Pets United. So, you know, you have a politician, he's running a charity about dogs. That That's like, everybody loves that, right? Helping strays, neutering strays, you know, kind of giving them to new families, and blah, 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 blah. Okay. Well, what the Times found out was, first of all, he said it was a 501c3 charity, like a real charity, like that he ran, right? That his whole thing. It was not a 501c3. It pretty clearly didn't even exist. But what happened in this in in this story? So this is a few years ago. You've got this disabled vet down in New Jersey, um, and uh, this the the disabled vet's service dog has some kind of tumor that needs to be removed. Big bad tumor. I don't think it was actually uh, a malignant tumor, but one of these tumors, obviously, it's big enough it can it can it can uh, it can kill you. Um, certainly for a, a, a dog. Um, and so it was going to be $3,000 to have the surgery and the vet and the guy doesn't, the guy's practically homeless. He doesn't have the money. So the vet says, Hey, I know I've heard of this guy, George Santos, actually not George Santos, Anthony DeVolder, cause he's working on one of his alternative identities. Um, and he has this charity. Maybe he can help out. Okay. So they set up a, a GoFundMe for the dog dog's name, Sapphire, right? They raised three thousand dollars, and then Santos just bails and keeps the money for himself, and the dog dies. I mean, <laughs> I, I I don't you know when we've heard all these stories about uh, you know Santos. He's getting all these big checks from these Republican richies out on Long Island, and he's living large, and who knows where the money's going. And, like, that's illegal. You shouldn't take people's money. You shouldn't swindle them. But that's kind of a, I don't know, it, it, it's, it's a kind of New York Post performance art, kind of, right? I mean, it's bad. But it, but but I'm not really broken up about it. Yeah, there are con men and swindlers and and whatever. But like this is this guy's service dog. He raises money. He raises three thousand dollars, and then he keeps it. Like I don't know how you get up the next day after that. Uh, you know there there are certain uh, it, th people do terrible things, but it's just like. The, the guy's clearly like a sociopath. Not because that thing, I mean, it's worse if you kill a bunch of people. But just the, you know, this is the thing with, with sociopaths. Other people don't exist for them. You know, there are people who do bad things and they feel kind of bad about it, but they wanted to do the bad thing more. Sociopaths aren't like that. They don't, there's a part of their brain that doesn't function. They're different from other people. And I really think Santos is um, is like that. Like, if you read the story, um, you know, he didn't just disappear. He started saying, well, you can't go to your, we can't go to uh, your vet. You need to come to my vet in Queens. And they go to this one vet, and that vet says, uh, yeah, I can't, can't do surgery. Dog's done for. I got to euthanize it. Sorry. And so Santo says, well, I guess you're out of luck. We're going to kind of take this money and save it for the, in a text, save it for the next dog. <laughs> you know? So the money is, is saved for this guy, for this guy's dog. And now Santos is like going to save it for the next dog. And there's this Twitter, there, not Twitter exchange, text exchange between the two. When the guy, the owner, you know, the vet is saying, 
can we, we need to find another vet. I know this is doable. We, we have the money. We need to find another vet. And, 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 and at this point, Santos is saying, I'll take the dog, but you can't come with us with the dog. And the dog's owner's like, what? Like, like, like how, you know, th- that's not okay. You know, anybody who has a pet, uh, you know, we get very attached to pets. You're not going to hand them over to some random who says like, oh, yeah, I got someone who's going to perform surgery. Don't worry about it. Just let me pick them up. I'll deal with it. No one's going to go for that. And in this text exchange, he starts shaming the guy. Santo starts shaming the guy. Like, and he has this line, we're, we're, our, our charity helps needy pets, not needy pet owners who want to like mooch a ride. And you're like, you're like, it, it, it you, you're like, who is this guy? And, and he starts saying, you know, we are a 501c3. We have to be so ethical. We have to account for every ride, every this. It's our sterling reputation that raised that money. So it doesn't even belong to your dog anyway. So you have this thing where there is no 501c3. It's a scam. The whole thing is a con. And as he's conning this guy and justifying the fact that he's keeping the money that was raised to save his dog, he's shaming the guy about his extreme level of integrity and all the audits that his 501c3... I mean, this guy's out there. I mean, it is a... It is a... um, the existence of a George Santos and is, is a, is a remarkable thing quite apart from politics. I mean, I was thinking yesterday, like when I, when I saw this story, like how many people have come forward? Like every day, some new person like, Oh yeah, he, uh, you know, he said he'd carry my groceries, but he took my groceries home with him. Like, Oh, okay. Or like, yeah, I lent, I lent him, uh, Lent him five thousand dollars, and uh, he never paid it back. And uh, then there's this other thing where I guess he he did a GoFundMe for his mother's funeral, and then just kept the money and went on a ski vacation. So like, he he's like the zealot of being evil. Like how many? Like are people still going to be coming forward like a year from now? Like with all these like petty, ridiculous heartless scams it's just unreal so uh as you can tell i'm 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 i am uh a bit obsessed in an ab psych sense um and we'll try to keep it uh, somewhat into uh you know within reigns maybe uh, kate will not be quite as obsessed with the, you know because we have a few other topics we're going to talk about but before we get to that um from the evil to the wonderful remember that uh The Josh Marshall Podcast brought to you by Grady's Cold Brew Ice Coffee. It's brewed strong with a blend of 100% Arabica coffee. Grady's foolproof bean bags take the mess and guesswork out of brewing. With rich, velvety coffee, you can drink iced, hot, spiked with a cocktail. Just steep it overnight and sip to your heart's content. Save yourself a stop and try Grady's any way you want. Ready to give it a swirl? Get 25% off at Grady'sColdBrew.com with promo code TPM. That's Grady'sColdBrew.com with promo code TPM. So, uh, co-host Kate Riga, how are you? How are you dealing with the with the ongoing uh, George Santos saga? You're probably not as obsessed as I am. Hmm. I think you're getting by. Yeah. I would say I don't have the same passion for it that you do. Um, But I definitely think it's interesting. And I think uh, the way that McCarthy has been kind of cornered in it is been. Oh, my God. I mean, you just you thought he could like kind of stoop no lower after the chaos of the speakership fight and then having his first response be like, well, you know, a lot of people around here embellish their resumes. You're like. (laughs) what (laughs) that's what you're gonna say um and then kind of following that up with you know we knew some things were fishy because uh one of his aides impersonated my chief of staff and you're like 
and that was cool with you <laughs> and not and not just impersonated impersonated to raise money right which is a, a felony i mean that's like there's also you know one of the, it, it's one of those uh one of those bad things that is actually 20 different um uh um crimes mm-hmm. it's probably wire fraud you know, uh, solicitation of fraudulent donation, uh, blah 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 blah. But yeah, for McCarthy's like, yeah, he uh, he impersonated my P- P- uh, chief of staff and was raising money, uh, saying it was for uh, us, and that was weird. But you know, those <laughs> things happen, right? Um, and I think I, I think you wrote about this, Josh. But the Santos's reaction to it all has been. Uh, kind of smart i think his engendering himself with like kind of the hard hard writers and going on bannon's podcast and cozying up to matt gates and all that stuff because you know that's a group of people who love to revile the press right which is where kind of all of these drips and drabs are coming from uh who stakes their their reputation who stakes their whole self on being you know refusing to apologize refusing to backtrack kind of sticking to their guns no matter what those guns are and so in that way it's like santos is kind of a perfect addition to the group totally 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 and you could see during the uh those you know ongoing votes for speaker because they had that thing where c-span was was allowed to sort of roam free and be feral um that when you watched, he was always with Matt Gates, mm-hmm. Lauren Boebert, um, Marjorie Green. Uh, you know, uh, it's look, you can't be a con man can't be stupid. I'm not saying they're geniuses, but they've got a certain kind of genius, right? To to just pull this shit off. You need I mean, it's a it's a sociopathic kind of genius, but it's it's something. And uh, as you say makes perfect sense that that's the if you are going to have to go to war with the fake news media and the rhino establishment you don't want to be there with like that don bacon guy right. or like i don't know who else who <laughs> who's who's the most normy republican in in the house you want like matt gates someone who's going to go like oh I had sex with underage girls. What? How about what you did? You know, just just like a what? What? You know, you need someone who's just gonna, who just doesn't care, and right. who's just at war. And and you know, he uh, he interviewed um, Gates interviewed Santos on you know he's filling in for Steve Bannon, uh, and he had this thing like you know they always come after the fighters. You exactly. can see you're a fighter, right? And like good, you know. Good call, Santos. I also think the revolution, the revelations, including ours, you know, from TPM, have just kind of taken a turn, particularly lately. Like the dog story is part of it. Uh, our reporting on donors saying that, like, the Santos campaign kind of took their, in one case, you know, something like a seventy-five dollar donation, and then just kept the credit card on file, and all of a sudden charges are showing up for other candidates. You know, not even just more from Santos than than this person intended to give, and all of it, I think, is getting kind of more and more malicious. I mean, obviously there is a malicious element from the beginning in lying to voters about who you are, but a lot of it was so weird and so like clownish and bumbling that it like almost sort of zany in a way right yeah, so it yeah, gave it yeah. this picture of like a talented mr ripley but in a the weirdest ways possible you know who we were joking before the pod you know who painted himself as a volleyball scholarship recruit to baruch which is like of all the lies you know obviously that that one probably didn't hurt a lot of people but it's so bizarre right and i think that kind of was the hallmark of it and now with more and more stuff coming out we are seeing a lot more hurting other people and swindling other people and a lot more kind of maliciousness behind the actions rather than just puffery i guess yeah um yeah and i do wonder if that's going to change the tenor because so far it really i do think the tone of everything has been kind of like what ha, other ha, ha. goofy thing yeah. did he lie about, you know? And that's been kind of my t- 
take on it at some level, you know, that there's, you know, in, in the, when, when you look at the, at the campaign finance stuff, there were two different cases that I think we focused on. One of which was the initial, the initial contribution was for a thousand dollars, legitimate contribution. So someone's given a thousand dollars They, they, you know, they, they must be relatively well off to give some, you know, give a candidate they don't even know that well a grand. Um, and then, uh, you know, kind of Santos Incorporated went to town and ended up charging like $17,000 of, of fake of fake contributions. And you're like, that just kind of takes your breath away, first right. of all, right? Um but also, and I think I, I get the sense that part of their scam was that they would find the kind of donors who were probably given a lot of money, given a lot of thousand dollar checks, right? Got rich people like this on both sides of the political, you know, very wealthy people who want to kind of engage in politics. And my sense was in some of those cases, you kind of get one donation from them and then you figure like these people are given a lot. They're not really going to notice, right? Kind of other charges. Oh, I must as, you know, clearly some people did notice. But then another case was someone like the original contribution was like 25 bucks. And then they charged this person like $9,000. Someone who gives 25 bucks doesn't have a lot of money. And like, you know, nine thousand dollars. You're maybe going to buy a used car with that. You know, it 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 it's it's uh it 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 it's just crazy. Um, yeah, and I think what's more interesting to me than just kind of him as a character is what it shows us about the Republican Party. And this is you know putting aside the fact that they need his vote, just kind of the obvious calculus there. We just had the committee assignment time, right? Where it was of interest for a few reasons, including that we saw some of McCarthy's concessions and that you had, you know, like the Greens and the Boberts appointed to actually important committees and things like that. But then you also, he put Santos on committees. And I mean, granted, they're like the small business administration, right? Like some of them that are kind of the little siblings of what you consider the big important committees. They're not the power committees. Yeah. Right. But he put him on the committees, you know, and he said, like, well, I don't want to set a precedent for, you know, punishing people with committee assignments or whatever, which is all just kind of rich, given what we've already gone through with um, Green and, and uh, Gosar and having the Democrats be the ones who strip them from their committees. But it's just kind of startling that the party has gone so far that even this person who clearly, clearly more damaging stuff is going to come out right like in a normal world you would not want this albatross slung around your neck because it's just so obvious we're not out of the woods with him <laughs> there is enough drip 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 to like fuel this new cycle for ages he's becoming one of the most well-known house members when he's up for re-election there's going to be you know outsized money and attention spent on his race even beyond what would be spent because it's a competitive you know democratic leaning seat yeah. but here they're not even doing like any kind of bare minimum punishment. It is just business as usual. They are happy to have them. You know, they're not even going to try to make him sit at a table by himself. He's, <laughs> he's part of the gang. Yeah, it, it's true. I mean, you know, look, there's uh committee assignments are a basic, I mean, there's no constitutional entitlement to being on a committee. You don't, you know, you're just you, your vote is all you are entitled to. Um, and so I understand at some level not wanting to, you know, before he's judged, take away things from him. Although, you know, kind of as we've said, wh what is there to judge? Right. right. I mean, there's 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 not much to judge. But what you would expect, at least, is. You know, OK. We'll put you on a committee, but kind of like what we have seen, what I would, what, what a normal speaker would say, um, if he wasn't, you know, holding on to the speakership by his fingernails and desperate to keep this guy's vote, would be something like, uh, you know, there's an ethics committee. I've heard there's some ongoing outside, you know, mm -hmm. investigations. Uh, I think 
uh, Mr. Santos should really consider whether he can focus enough to really represent the people of New York's third district. And, you know, if, if, if maybe he should bow out or something like that, you know, just to kind of to signal like this isn't okay. Like it's not remotely okay. And we're not going to like, you know, we're not going to expel you from the house. We're not going to, you know, before there is any formal judgment, take away your committee assignments or not give you committee assignments but not leaving not leaving any question kind of like the right thing for him to do is to get the fuck out of here <laughs> you know right. but as you said uh uh um mccarthy's thing has just been like hey you know who of us has you know set a fish is a little <laughs> bigger than it was in in you know in 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 real life you know right. kind of the embellishing his resume i mean <laughs> even it's funny it's with someone like him I even find myself getting pulled into his his ridiculousness because like saying you worked at three major banking institutions when you never worked at any of them that is not embellishing. Right. You know, what is that thing from the office you're like assistant manager or assistant to the manager? <laughs> yeah. That's embellishing. This is not embellishing. Right. Okay. Let's talk about um, the Biden docs a little bit, which you previewed in the intro, Josh. And where we are now is Merrick Garland last week called a press conference where he appointed this guy, Robert Hur, a former U.S. attorney from Maryland, to be the special counsel. Um, and so he is going to kind of look at everything, see if there's anything illegal afoot. By this point, we had... I guess like kind of three or four revelations, which became easier to track when Garland put put a timestamp on everything, but kind of di these disparate discoveries of classified documents um, at the the think tank where Biden had an office before between the end of the vice presidency and before he started his 2020 candidacy, and then some found in his Wilmington home. Um, so that's kind of where we are now. And like you say, I think the discourse about this, I mean, it's been predictably bad from the usual Beltway offenders, but kind of bad in an interesting way, because I have not really seen any of the kind of bullshit we you would usually expect, which would be Biden's thing is just as bad as Trump's, right? And the people who who don't see that are, are biased. Like that hasn't so much been it. The theme of it has been obviously Biden's stuff is not bad the way Trump says, but it doesn't matter because that's politics, baby. And that's where we are. Yeah. Which basically. is close, but like a, a step different, right? Where you at least even have these usual kind of fonts of bad faith saying, because it's it's obvious. It's not complicated, right? You had one guy who found the documents and called up the, the archives immediately and was like, are bad. You need to take these back. And then you have the guy who was fighting about it for months and months and trying to hide it and moving them around the complex and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's it's just it's not that high level of stuff. Yeah, no, it's it's it doesn't. It, there's really no. Um, as you say, th th there's 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 no way to make any case that the things really have anything to do with each other. Um, so this is the kind of the plan B to make it that it's still a huge crisis and blah, 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 blah. And even on the thing about, you know, is it a huge crisis? Well, obviously people want to make it a huge crisis. You know, to me, I'm pretty confident that I know who Joe Biden is, that he wouldn't knowingly try to like steal a classified, you know, classified document and have it in his own, uh, in his own, uh, what is the thing, you know, file drawer or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it was entirely unnecessary to appoint a special counsel, a special counsel who is a Trump appointee and is clearly like a big movement conservative. Um, however, should they look at it? Sure. Look at everything. And um, 
I have relative confidence that it'll be so obvious that even someone who might have a bit of a political axe to grind will have to recognize that. And if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong, and somehow uh, when Joe Biden was leaving the vice presidency, he's like, man, this one classified document, I really like this one. Mm -hmm. I'm keeping this shit. Then, then he should be held accountable. I'm quite confident that that is not the case. So I don't really care um, because, you know, I, I think I know who these people are. And frankly, uh, you know, when, a, when the vice president of the United States uh, clears out when they're done being, being vice president, they're not going through every document themselves. I doubt very much that Joe Biden put these documents there. But again, investigate it. It's under the DOJ. Take a look. If I'm totally wrong about Joe Biden and he's really terrible, then he should absolutely be held accountable. But I'm just not worried about it. I do want to add, I think this is so profoundly stupid, like so Bush League from the Biden staff who was in charge of this. It just, it feels so much like a stupid, unnecessary kerfuffle of their own making, you know, it's just, and I, I'm not, do you mean, do you mean in the, when the stuff was packed up seven years ago or whatever? Yes. I mean, everything from there has been responsible by the book. I don't know how you can possibly quibble with like calling the cops on yourself in this case, but it's just like, it's just so avoidable. I don't know. Just go through the stuff. And I get it. There's a lot of papers and whatever. But this is one of those where it just feels to me like, oh, my God, you really tripped themselves up here and, and created kind of what feels like a wholly avoidable, stupid news cycle that they have to kind of contend with while Republicans are so willingly making fools of themselves on on the national stage. Yeah, you know, you wish it wouldn't have happened. And and I don't know what the, you know, what the specifics uh, were. I mean, obviously this is, um, we didn't, this happened, I guess this happened in, um, you know, sometime in late 2016, early 2017, basically. Um, we didn't know about the Trump stuff. And, you know, things just happen. You know, people make mistakes. Uh, again, to me, you let the, let the cards fall where they may, you know, it, it seems to me it's a kind of a, an innocent slip up that was addressed as soon as they found out about it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it is quite clear that there wouldn't be really any investigation of it absent the need of Merrick Garland to fall over himself to, show that he's, you know, absolutely positively uh, being being fair to everybody. But again, because I think I know the players involved and how they operate, go ahead and investigate it. Totally. It does just get a bit tiresome, that whole need of, it just feels like such from a different era, but the democratic need to show that they are being totally 100% accountable all the time, no matter that it'll launch 8,000 bad faith ships, you know, it's just like, I mean, even the, some people were pointing this out that Garland took about two seconds to get a special prosecutor or a special counsel to look at the Biden stuff. And then the period on the Trump stuff was quite a lot more prolonged, you know, I mean, it's just, and this is who Democrats are. This is who Merrick Garland is. So I guess it shouldn't surprise us anymore, but you know, and it all feeds into uh, what our colleague David Kurtz wrote about, which is just this whole thing where special counsels or investigators always have to be Republicans because Democrats have to show that they're being fair and blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, oh, my God. OK, I guess we're still doing this even even now. I think the thing is, at least Merrick Garland has some statutory and ethical responsibility to look into things, to be aware of the Department of Justice's, um, uh, you know, reputation for fairness, and the guidelines, they're ambiguous, but basically say if there's any question, you kind of, you know, absent yourself from it. He's at least operating in 
a recognizable and real framework, even if I think he is going overboard. What gets me is I see Democratic senators or members of the House asked about this, and they say, well, I, I, I certainly want to see if, uh, you know, a, a kind of a review to see how our national security was possibly compromised by this, and uh, I really wish it wouldn't happen, and um, wow, I'm, I'm just embarrassed. And, and, and like, you know, it is a little embarrassing, but it is a little embarrassing, a little. Uh, you know, if, if you were going to, Democrats have this need to, they think there is some audience that they are appealing to, to get, to to gain credibility for going the extra length when the extra length doesn't even make any sense. And there actually is no audience for that. You know, if if I'm a senator and I'm asked about this, I would say, you know, it sounds like some documents were misfiled and it's going to be investigated, but give me a break if we're comparing this to the former president stealing a large number of government documents, claiming they were his own property, denying that he had them, moving them around his house to prevent the government getting them back. Don't even talk to me about these things being the same. Because they're not the same. And sort of any, any, any democratic... Um, office holder, democratic elite, who doesn't say that is, I think, an idiot and pathetic. This is not a matter of, you know, what I hear from people is, well, you got to hold some, you hold your own side to some standards. I do hold my own side to some standards. They should do better. And now that's going to be an investigation into, you know, why these, why these documents were misfiled. Have the investigation. I'm not saying it should be covered up or I'm, you know, I'm not afraid of it being investigated because I don't think there's anything there. And if I'm wrong and there is something there, okay, then I was wrong. And 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 whoever should be held accountable. But de- Democrats are just pathetic that way. They just are. And it always creates such a profound mismatch because Republicans, you know, with a few exceptions, but largely all of them just circle the wagons you know when this kind of stuff happens like with when the fbi raided trump's house we didn't hear about well like well we gotta keep our own side accountable right we heard (laughs) abolish the fbi like this is an unprecedented attack on a president you know i mean and as silly as that is and i don't think anyone's advocating for democrats to become like republicans one thing it's hard to fault them for is they you know they're gonna be on their own side no matter what and Democrats just do not have the instinct to do that. And it does create, I think it gives just more, you know, it pours more gasoline on these kind of fires because then that, then you have all this bunch of stories of Democrat, you know, Democrats, even Democrats disapproval yes, with the yes, Biden, yes. you know, blah, yeah. blah, blah. And it's just like, and that's exactly what all the Beltway, you know, our Beltway offenders want to write about. So it's just a never ending self feeding loop, you know, while Fox News is screaming to the high heavens about how Trump has been more mistreated than any president in history. Well, and it, it, it's also, it's not about, it's not about not holding your own side accountable. Hold Joe Biden or his staffers accountable for what actually happened here, which is barely anything. Right. And again, they're they're going to investigate it. Great, see, you know, get to the bottom of if anything happened. If it's more than than we think, but so it's not even a matter of well, you need to learn to circle the wagons and defend your own people. Keep the the reality of the situation forefront. And if you are not making crystal clear how these things are not in any way comparable. 
you're basically just misleading people. So it's not even about it's not even about circling the wagons. It's about not becoming part of the problem and becoming part of misleading people again because there's this mystery audience out there somewhere who you are gaining your your you know gaining uh credibility in their eyes by basically just being a putz yeah i mean it, it reminds you of kind of we have a new outlet spring up every six months or so it feels like that their driving mission statement is uh you know no partisan holds from either side we're straight shooters we know that the left is just as bad as the right and we're not going to do it and whenever you see those you're just like who is this for you know it it really is it's like you say it's as if the republican party would chill out if someone would just bring and deliver them the facts in an unfrilly way you know and it's just It doesn't matter how much experience we get that that's simply not the reality we're living in. It is such a cherished idea by some segment of the political world that it just keeps springing up again and again and again. Yeah, we we actually had a our own little run in with sort of like one of those kind of (laughs) outfits that will (laughs) remain will remain nameless, but they will live in infamy because I've hated them forever. So the so if on the off chance that they're researching the podcast, you know who you are, <laughs> and you are utter scoundrels, and you guys are ridiculous, and and blah. Part and blah, of the problem. Blah. That's you're part of the problem. You're so part of the problem. All right, what else? So let's um loop in a question before we move on to our last topic. Uh, before we leave the Biden docs, this is from Henry. He says uh, the posture from the Biden White House this week. Uh, and this question was from last week, seems to be that the think tank discovery was a simple mistake or innocent oversight and that they're cooperating to answer the hypocrisy police. Could you remind us whether Trump ever even claimed it was a whoopsie? Which is so funny because Team Trump rifled through so many claims in and outside of court, but I don't think this was ever one of them. Well, I think they, I think one one level of stuff was that they said the GSA, the government's, mm-hmm. it's, it's, they changed the, it, it's still the GSA. It used to be Government Services Administration, you know, basically the landlord of the government, you know, and they're the movers and everything. And one of their arguments was that, hey, the GSA guys did the move. We didn't do it. So that was kind of an oopsie. Mm. But as it happens, though, the GSA people didn't do it. <laughs> so that was not, so it wasn't, it wasn't they, you know, look, the this would be entirely different it, you know whether it was true or not let's say a couple months into 2021 uh national archives found out about this they say hey we you know you got to send this stuff back and then the trump people would say you know you know it wasn't really contested but in their minds it was, you know, it wasn't clear until the last minute that the administration was over. So it was all in a rush. We took some stuff. We weren't, you know, the stuff got confused. Um, we're going to send you some stuff back. And why don't you send your people down here just to make sure nothing's, you know, nothing's amiss. You never would have heard the second. There never would have been anything. There never would have been a criminal investigation. There never would have been kind of any of this. Um, you know, the scale of stuff they took sort of speaks for itself. Um, but you know, people lose sight of the fact that things have to be really bad for the Department of Justice to authorize a raid on the house of a former president. This had been going on for a year and a half, this cat and mouse game. So, but to the answer, I think there there was that sort of semi oopsie argument that briefly had a moment but it was a uh you know kind of an oopsie with an asterisk since it was oh these other guys did it mm-hmm. which they didn't do it and and they made the mistake so a little bit and they pretty quickly moved on to no just kidding we declassified all these things with our brains before we left this is a matter of these are personal documents not presidential documents so trump owns them uh you know we pretty we had a, a whole cascade of well and there was well, also just like 
there was also just like we we don't have them. You you right. think we have them, but we don't. We fully they, complied with the subpoena, et cetera. Et cetera. Yeah, and they so yeah so but to the answer there was a yeah sort of semi oopsie in there at one point. And then the last thing we wanted to talk about um, is the situation going on in the Ohio House of Representatives because it has some interesting parallels to what what has happened with the U.S. House. And basically what happened is they they're thanks to, you know, cumulative gerrymanders, Ohio Republicans have super majorities in both chambers. And those super majorities only grew this cycle. And previously, the House GOP conference had all agreed that this guy, Marin, was going to be their speaker. You know, they had taken like an informal vote earlier. And then we get to the formal vote. All of a sudden, this guy, Jason Stevens, who is a Republican, but less of a wing nut than Marin, wins. Total huge upside, uh, upset. And then, you know, what transpires is that he had been working throughout the month of December to get all of the Democrats in the Ohio House on board to get their votes and then ended up winning with this coalition of all the Democrats and then a couple dozen of the, you know, less crazy House Republicans. Um, And what's interesting about that is that we still don't exactly, no one's really talking about what was agreed upon, like what made the Democrats give him their votes. Now, let me ask you, is it a case where he literally got all the Democrats or he got a big chunk of the Democrats and and a big chunk of the Republicans, but kind of isolated the far right people? Every single Democrat. Every single Democrat. Yeah. And what has been speculated is that one of this other guy who would probably have been in in this you know the speakership cabinet of the the far right Marin guy he had introduced this bill that would raise the threshold of citizen initiated ballot proposals in Ohio to 60% and that obviously is going to have a lot of ramifications in the abortion world and the redistricting world and everything and so that was kind of this freight train that was headed headed our way. And then Stevens wins instead, the moderate guy, he wins the gavel. And all of a sudden, that's totally in doubt because Stevens was against it in the lame duck. He didn't like the proposal. And now everyone kind of thinks that was probably part of the deal, right? Democrats said, we'll give you our votes if you don't bring this bill to the floor. Now, has there been with Stevens, you know, because while the stuff was going on with McCarthy, Mm -hmm. People kept asking us, well, all they have to do is find, you know, a few, a few repu- few moderate Republicans, uh, and then they'll have, you know, uh, uh, Hakeem Jeffries, or more likely they'll have some moderate Republicans, sort of all along that model. Mm-hmm. And um, at the national level, I mean, I'm quite confident of this, but my response was always like, they can do that, but every Republican who participates in that is toast in 2024. So if they want to end their careers doing that, great, but that's not going to happen. Is there any sense that that something like that is brewing in Ohio or is just kind of the dynamics a little different? Well, it's funny because since that's happened, the state Republican Party censured all of the 22 Republicans who voted for this moderate Republican to be speaker. Okay. And But the people who they censured, I think the difference is, you know, when we had the House Republicans say vote for Trump's second impeachment, there was a sense that they knew that might be a fatal blow, right? The way they talked about it was, you know, this kind of already cloaked in the idea of this was a vote I had to take, right? Regardless of the ramifications. In the Ohio House, the people who were censured are pissed like really 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 angry and saying things like i'm a republican i voted for a republican for speaker and i'm getting censured are you kidding me like you know one person uh, one of the censured guys has a quote of it looks like we got the the crazy guys running the asylum right like they are really mad because some of these people are longtime ohio house conservatives who are very very conservative Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. they were just not enamored with this kind of super far right emergent faction right so that's a situation and then you have 
Marin and the other disappointed kind of far right wing nuts gather behind closed doors to create what they are calling the Republican majority caucus, basically a splinter faction saying that is the actual Republican majority. And they are the actual leaders of the Republican party in the house speaker be damned. And now they're creating this really interesting situation where if the speaker wants to get anything done, he's probably going to have to work with the Democrats. So all of a sudden we have this super minority of Ohio house Democrats Potentially with the most power they've all ever had, even while their numbers are getting increasingly dwarfed by by Republicans who are getting elected. Huh. I mean, it's 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 fascinating. I mean, I I, I get I mean, clearly they want to, um, you know, they want to make the Stevens guys experiment a failure. Right. Um, and I guess it'll be sort of an interesting, I mean, the Democrats have to sort of make a call here. Do they really want to make him kind of govern like a Democrat and have the whole thing explode after two years? Because it, in a lot of these states, you have <laughs> the paradox is that in a lot of these states that are trending Republican, Ohio being an extreme example of that, not that it's so Republican relative to some of the most Republican states, but it's a state that until quite recently was seen as a swing state. Um, and obviously there's going to be a big Senate election uh, there mm-hmm. for Sherrod Brown in, in 2024 that through just actual changes in public opinion and gerrymandering, the Republican caucuses are getting so big that something like this can happen that some of them can say like, we don't really need those, those like 30 freaks over there. Mm -hmm. We can maybe kind of run the place, you know, on, on our, on our own. And, 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 but it's, but it's, you know, look, these things, um, these, the leadership of a state party is almost, especially in Republican States is almost always much more conservative than, um, than the elected officials in that state. I mean, every couple of years, you'll see something from like the Texas Republican Party where they want to hold a vote on secession for like Texas to leave the country, <laughs> you know. To, so what, you know, just what the, uh, just what the state Republican Party does is one thing. Um, obviously, it comes down to voters, you know, what what these, who who can, what happens in uh in two years this is the house right so mm-hmm. i guess that they're on two year on a on a two year cycle. now have 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 all the republicans who did not vote for stevens joined this uh you know kind of gop truth caucus as it were they were at least all invited to the conference and i haven't really seen people making a lot of fuss about not wanting to be included in the number. It's interesting because that, uh, well, it's, you know, it's, it's partisanship works a little differently at the state level. Mm -hmm. It's not quite, um, you know, in some ways, in some ways things can be more extreme at the state level but it's not, you know, in, in in our contemporary politics in the United States, you know, it's Nancy Pelosi and it's Kevin McCarthy. And you're kind of, you're a Pelosi person, you're a McCarthy, you know, everybody, it, it's sort of like, you know, you're, you're, it's uh, the, God, what was that? Oh, God, who did the Giants beat a few days ago? <laughs> My son is a huge Giants fan. I should remember, totally spacing. Oh. It was, uh, oh, the Vikings, the Vikings. Yeah. Um, it's not like in the middle of the game, you're going to be like, wait, am I a Giants fan or a Vikings fan? Right? I mean, you know who you're a fan of at the right. federal level. But at the state level, it's not always quite so clear. It's not that you don't know you're a Republican, but which Republican and maybe, you know, so it's, 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 it's very interesting. I, 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 um, I certainly don't think anything like that is going to happen at the at the federal level in this country at any time ever. Um, But where the rubber is going to meet the road is on potential discharge petitions out of the House, because the and this is something I was writing. I'm not sure I finished post about this. 
you know, there's this rule where basically if you get a majority of the members to sign a document, you can force a vote on something. And you've got these 18 Republicans in Biden districts. And as things get kind of crazier, right, on the Republican side, and 2024 gets closer, that is going to become a real issue. And I suspect that is, um, I suspect that may be a way that um, possibly, you know, that may come into play with the debt ceiling. What a wonderful segue. Here we have a question from Eric who says, isn't the discharge petition just part of the House rules subject to a majority vote? Is it possible that these right-wing nutballs on the Rules Committee could change the rules that govern discharge petitions to take away this option for resolving the debt ceiling crisis? Is it possible that something in the, sec- in the secret three-page amendment defangs or eliminates the possibility of using a discharge petition? First of all, uh, the way the discharge petition works, and I'm not an expert on it, but generally speaking, the way it works is it's not you just show up with the list of names and like that afternoon there's a vote. There's like a 30 day thing. And, there, you know, there are some things that the majority can do to kind of try to slow it down. Um, but basically, I think the answer is no, because the discharge petition only matters or works if they can get a majority of the members of the House. Maybe they get 220 uh, members of the House to sign this discharge petition. That will mean that a majority have decided that whatever that discharge petition is, they want. And the majority gets to do whatever it wants to do. So in that sense, I think the answer is no, because you can't change the rules if you don't have the majority of votes in the House. So there are, this is not a particularly easy thing to do. Um, There are ways that the majority could try to um, stop it. Um, But if you have four, five, six Republicans who really want that discharge petition to work, they're the majority, and you can't change the rules with a minority of the votes of the House. So I think, at least narrowly speaking, that kind of nothing you know nothing matters. They're just going to change the rules. That I think cannot happen. If if you have the majority of the votes, in which case you know, which is the whole point in the first place. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then one last question from Carl, who says, "What would make the investigation by Robert Hur look suspicious?" And thus. For him, uh, it would happen if it drags out for a long time, like the Durham probe, or is very leaky, like uh, the Ken Starr probe. I think either of those, um, you know, would be would be bad signs. I think, um, you know, I, I I think the look. I'm going into this with the assumption that this was a minor instance of clerical sloppiness. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's go in with that assumption. The only way you want to get concerned is if it ends up being sort of like what we had with that judge um, down in down in Florida, where where remember, the judge starts doing, you know, kind of making these rulings for Trump. And and really, everybody, even the kind of the Trumpers are saying, like, that's not what the law says. Like, what are you talking about? Right. And I think where you want to be concerned is if you see, if you start seeing legal actions that take what clearly seem to be uh, non malicious actions and are interpreting them as malicious and trying to bend the law to that purpose. Um, that's, that's when I would be concerned, um, I guess leaks too. I mean, my basic sense here is that if you have an ambiguous case, I'd be pretty concerned about having a special counsel whose CV reads like, you know, 
kind of like another uh, Federalist Society homunculus, basically. Um, but I don't think this is a close call. And I don't think someone like that is going to kind of trash a reputation like this woman, this woman judge down in, down in um, Florida did just because they love Trump. So that's my, that's my sense of that. Yeah, I agree. All right. Okay. Well, there's some quality uh, content for you for this week's episode. Let me remind you that the Josh Marshall podcast is brought to you by Grady's Cold Brew Ice Coffee. You can get 25% off on every order if you use the promo code TPM. So just go to Grady'sColdBrew.com. That's you it. You can tell your son from me, go Eagles. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Do not say that in this house. The Giants <laughs> are going all the way. No way. All the way. All right. All right. Well, we'll Later. see you next week. Yeah. See you next week. The Josh Marshall Podcast is hosted by me, TPM reporter Kate Riga, and TPM founder, editor-in-chief Josh Marshall. The show is produced by Jackie Wilhelm. Thanks to Why Not Jansfeld for our podcast theme song. And thanks to all our TPM members who make this possible. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and subscribe wherever you listen.